All right. Hello, everyone. We're about to get started. So first of all, welcome, and thanks for coming to tonight's author event. I just have a couple of quick reminders before we get started. First, please remember to silence your cell phone. Next, at the end of the author's um, presentation, there'll be time for Q&A, so get your questions ready. Um, we have a number of other great events coming up, too. I brought some of our May brochures, so you can check them out there or online. Um, and yeah, let's get started. Richard Munson is a writer whose recent works include Tesla, inventor of the modern, and Cousteau, the captain in his world. In addition to writing, Munson has worked on clean energy and environmental issues for nonprofits in the private sector, at universities, and on Capitol Hill. His most recent, he most recently was senior director of the Environmental Defense Fund, where he advanced smart power in the Midwest. Tonight, he is here to talk about his latest book, Tech to Table, 25 Innovators Reimagining Food. And we have copies in our catalog, and we'll have copies at the end to purchase and get signed. All right, and now let's welcome Richard Munson. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Um, thank you, Nathan, for your kind both invitation and um, introduction. I like short ones myself. Uh, I was, um, it was about four years ago, I was honored to uh, speak here about my then current book or new book, uh, a biography of Nikola Tesla, who is that, as you might know, that, that eccentric, rather eccentric, and certainly um, brilliant uh, genius that gave us electric motors, robots, remote control, our modern economy, I suppose. Um, I'll repeat um, the observation that I gave then, um, is that as I walk around this library, you people are so unbelievably lucky <laughs> to have such a wonderful institution here. Um, I, um, you know, little did I know at the time that I would get invited back, which I greatly appreciate, so thank you. But also, um, I think uh, the inspiration of being here uh, enhanced my appreciation for libraries so much so that I um, ran for the board of um, and be got elected to become a trustee of my local library in Hinsdale, Illinois, which is about 20 miles um, to the west of Chicago. So I thank you <laughs> both for um, coming out um, again, but also to commend this library for the work that it really does to advance, you know, creativity to really spur, I guess, you know, intellectual freedom and also in particularly for this type of event to advance, you know, entrepreneurship. So, thank you. Um, I'm, um, as you might guess from the work that, uh, that I spoke about before about Nikola Tesla, I've long been interested in innovators. Um, and particularly on the clean energy side, but a couple of years ago I decided that I would start looking at innovation in the agricultural industry, in part because it is the world's largest economic sector. It's about $17 trillion every year, in part because it's also at the core of so many of the problems that we sort of have to address, be that immigration, you know, climate change, equity, nutrition, the list sort of goes on. But I became particularly um, interested in farming because it was revealed to me that the farming sector is the least digitalized economic sector in our economy. Um, and some people think that means that it's the least modernized. Um, in my view, that means that there's real problems of not being more technologically advanced, but there's also then opportunities for innovation and entrepreneurs um, to make advances. So um, I also learned that you know, agriculture, when it comes to research and development, is a real laggard. You, know, you look at the healthcare industry, they spend about 21% of their budget on R&D. You know, automobile industry is what, about 12%, I think. But R&D for the food and farm sector is less than 1% of the budget. So what's happening, is, is in my view, is that money that is being spent is largely um, focused on protecting current practices rather than revealing novel ones. Um, so I went in search of people that were doing novel things. Um, and I guess as a writer, the great part is you get to go talk to people and meet them and find out what novel things they um, happen to be up to. So over the next half hour or so, um, in front of what I hope are a whole lot of questions from you and discussion, 
um, I'd like to introduce you to several of the entrepreneurs that I met um, that are trying to bring innovation to the farm and food sectors. Um, allow me to um, announce at the beginning that food is a very dangerous topic to discuss, and I know that um, because we, um, f what we eat is part of our culture, it is um, part of our identity. Uh, we have almost religious fights amongst you know, our, our friends uh, about what we eat, uh, and we argue heatedly about the various choices. So be aware, I have, um, and the book does nothing to try and resolve those issues, uh, and I have um, no interest in trying to suggest to you what you should be eating. So uh, with that caveat, I'll also admit that agriculture is a difficult um, topic to discuss since it elicits very diametrically opposed views of its role in our society. I mean, on the positive side, you know, go to our modern you know, supermarket. At almost any time of the year, you can walk in and get in season and out of season fresh um, vegetables and fruits. You get assorted cereals, dairy, meats, the, the list goes on. It is a supply chain marvel. Um, it was challenged, of course, by COVID, but it is still a remarkable way to deliver enormous diversity of food to folks. The other thing I would point out is that um, food's share of the average American's um, budget has fallen by about a half since 1950 to about 10 percent. What that means is that uh, more food is available to more people. And I'd also point out, you know, another positive is that when you go around and you meet with farmers, you are sort of, at least I was, blown away by um, how effective and often fervent they are in their stewardship of their own land. So all positive things. However, on the, there's a second set of images in which agriculture is in trouble and causes trouble. Industrialized agriculture, according to some estimates, is the largest single cause of climate change um, on this planet. And that's largely, odd, oddly enough, um, because cows burp. And they've got a stomach, when they burp, they release methane, which is what, John, 94% time? Um, the um, toxicity, if you will, of, um, of carbon dioxide. Um, and there's a billion of these things um, around the planet burping a lot every day. So the output from just the livestock sector is more than the combined you know, output of, um, from greenhouse gas emissions from all the cars, all the trucks, the trains, the airplanes, um, all of those combined. Um, we also think about um, other sides. We think about um, other problems associated with plowing, for instance, that exposes farmlands to rain and wind erosion. We lead to the loss. We're losing 30 soccer fields of soil every single minute. Think about that. It just goes down rivers. It's gone. Um, we clear-cut forests to make room for more farms, to grow more corn and more soybeans, to feed more cows. What that means is it takes away some of the diversity of our planet, um, and it uh, leads to um, uh, m releasing more greenhouse gases. We irrigate crops, um, sucking up almost 80% of the planet's um, fresh water, depleting aquifers and causing um, acidifying soils. We spray synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and eliminating in the process beneficial microbes and the runoff of the, this, um, you know, uh, poisons um, ends up poisoning private wells or creating dead zones in oceans or lakes. This, you probably recognize, is the green scum from which um, nothing can survive um, in Lake Erie. Um, then there's the issue of animal welfare. Um, in addition to a massive scale of slaughter, um, pigs and chickens spend most of their lives in cramped cages or jammed feedlots. Another huge challenge, of course, it relates to equity and nutrition. Large, some large farmers are doing very well, but there's a whole lot of small farmers that are quite struggling and trying to figure out how to pass on their farms to the next generation. Um, well, there's also the shock that there are 14% of American households lack sufficient food and they find themselves in pantry lines like this um, looking for um, something to eat. And then there's also just the shock that in this country about 40% of the, 
we're approaching 40% of our residents are what is considered obese as a result of the diets they have. So these two competing images, you know, on the great side, the supermarket, and the other side, some of the various problems, um, they prompt, I think, very competing visions for what the future should be. And, and in incredibly simplistic terms, on the one side you have big ag or industrial agriculture, and on the other side you have organic or regenerative agriculture, and they have different solutions. You know, the first group would suggest we need to continue to use chemicals, irrigation, and concentrated feedlots. The other side believes in uh, winter cover crops, free-range animals, and more, um, less and less um, uh, chemicals. I would argue that neither camp has proven capable of providing sufficient supplies of nutritious food in a way that doesn't harm the environment. Pollution and malnutrition, as I just mentioned, are prevalent within our current major system of big ag. Um, and despite appeals for decades, organic farming is still less than 1% of the cropland in this country. And efforts to have broad adoption of regenerative practices has really not taken off. So in my research that I did for my book, um, I met largely what I think are somewhat unrecognized in innovators that may represent a third path. Not big ag, not regenerative agriculture, but innovation, entrepreneurship. Um, and this advance of disruptive technologies, um, they think, will feed a growing population both nutritiously and sustainably. And they offer um, creative approaches that can increase options for both farmers and consumers. But let me go to more big ag. Um, this issue of focusing on innovation within the farm and um, agricultural sector um, highlights, I guess, two other vastly different images that come to mind. I love different contrasting images, as you can tell from this discussion. On the one side, you've got the, the vast farm fields of the great Midwest, you know, and they go on for acres and acres and acres. On the other side, you have the sleek, you know, steel and, um, you know, glass, you know, technology centers. And to be honest, those sides have not met, uh, which is why agriculture is the least digitalized sector in the, United, in the American economy. But I think what is um, happening is that within just the last few years, these two images are colliding, and innovators are beginning to redefine what it means to farm and even the nature of food. They have soared, ag tech startups have soared about 80% per year over the last decade. That's a massive growth. In the last year alone, in 2021, they attracted $52 billion of private sector investment. Now granted, that went down a bit last year, as did private sector investment in, in virtually everything because of the economy. But they are booming in the sense of, of spending a lot of their own money to try to advance disruption into this um, fairly conventionalized uh, system. So before meeting a few of these entrepreneurs, let me... Um, raise what I think are two uh, critical issues um, uh, relative to this innovation. And the first is, why now? I mean, we've known about agriculture old challenges for years, but why suddenly within the last few years has been so much investment gone into disruptive technologies? I think the short answer is that we live in a rather unique era um, that we sometimes just don't recognize that the rapid and stunning technological advances that are happening around us. Particularly, as Eric Schmidt, who is the former CEO of Google, said, we have this confluence of particular three huge changes. One is on the availability of data. We have so many new, modern, sophisticated sensors to collect data. We have more than we have ever had. And the second thing, we now have fast computers, sophisticated computers, that can process that data. And then also we have now mechanized engineering or robots to act on that information and data. And that whole change, according to Schmidt, says it's a super evolution that he claims will fundamentally, irrevocably transform wide-ranging industries. And he claims that the innovations allow startups, not big ag, but startups, 
to advance faster than incumbents resulting in, he said, agile, powerful companies. So within this last few years, this super evolution um, has finally begun to reach the agricultural sector, spurred by rather agile entrepreneurs and creative investors that they see opportunities to profit through innovation. They see a chance because they're aggressive entrepreneurs that they think that they can outcompete out big ag they think of as being slow-moving oligopolies. So a second perhaps fundamental question is, should we trust them? <laughs> okay. I, we have you know, green revolution technologists of the 1950s and 1960s did marvelous things. They enhanced you know, crop output, they reduced worldwide hunger, and yet at the same time, um, they contaminated lands and water, they decreased food diversity, they limited competition. Think also of DDT. I mean, this was going to be a miracle in the sense of how its effectiveness in getting rid of nasty little bugs. But obviously, it resulted in having hazards. So um, you can't blindly accept new technologies and just think that they'll all be good. But I think that this confluence of technologies, this advance of sensors and computing power, allows us to judge entrepreneurs quite strictly, I hope, uh, by their long-term sustainability. Do they, in fact, protect the planet? And also, on their equity. Are they providing nutritious food to a growing population? So what I did as I went around the country, I profiled um, 25 food and farm innovators. I'm not going to discuss them all tonight. You will be thankful to know that. Um, I found it particularly interesting, though, that almost all of them um, were new to agriculture. They have not been involved in this industry before. They are bringing fresh perspectives to this rather conventional and massive industry. Also striking, they take a variety of approaches. They don't think that there's any silver bullet out there to solve any of these problems. Um, but I think their diversity suggests that these op there is opportunity for improvement. I could have chosen a whole lot of other entrepreneurs, and I will be the first to admit that some of these startups are going to fail, some are going to flounder, um, some are going to be bought up by other companies, um, some of the original entrepreneurs are going to be replaced by more business savvy managers. Um, but startups are hard, uh, they're very hard. I was involved in one, and trust me, it was hard. Um, although I think the, the new development that is often overlooked that I hope that some of these innovators um, display is that um, people are placing billion dollar bets of their own money, not the government's money, their own money, on thinking that they can profit by making the world better through improving innovation um, within the ag and the food sectors. So let's meet a few of these, finally. <laughs> um, not 25, but some. Um, let's start with, I don't know why we got that, Uma Valetti. Um, he came to the United States from India um, for a um, cardiology residency at the Mayo Clinic where he um, focused on um, prompting stem cells to replace um, um, damaged cells um, from people who had heart attacks. Um, having grown up in India, he had um, grown concerned about animal cruelty and contamination at slaughterhouses, so he slowly realized that he could do the same thing that he's doing in his day job as far as getting stem cells to um, fix broken muscles, take um, stem cells from animals and turn it into muscle, which is essentially what meat is. Um, and so he concluded, and he has this great line, um, that if I continued as a cardiologist, I might save a few thousand lives over the next 30 years. But if I am successful in helping to change the way meat is made, I can positively impact billions of human lives and trillions of animal lives. So in 2015, he founded Memphis Meats, which he recently renamed Upside Meats, then rather focus, then focus on plant-based alternatives, which we've read a lot about, um, you know, a lot of the fast food restaurants are now serving plant-based hamburgers and things. He extracts cells painlessly from animals and inserts them into a growth potion of nutrients, salts, and acidic buffers, and they multiply in bioreactors 
look and act a whole lot like beer um, tanks at um, a beer brewery. Um, Valetti admits that some consumers are gonna think it is really weird um, to be eating cell cultured burgers or chicken nuggets, but he would argue that it's even weirder to be eating slaughtered animals um, in fecal contaminated uh, meats. And he predicts that eaters will, see here are a few of his uh, offerings, um, uh, eaters will embrace these new offerings once they experience their meaty taste and understand their environmental and health benefits. He recognizes two things that a lot of entrepreneurs have to recognize. One is that their costs have to fall, and two is their production capacity has to increase. He's trying both. Um, on the cost side, they have dropped substantially. Not enough, but they've really dropped quite substantially. Um, Israeli-based um, future meat technology claims that its cultured meat this year, by the end of this year, will be about $10 a pound. That's still about 20% higher than grass-fed beef that you can get at you know, nice markets. But it is an amazing drop, $10 a pound, from what it was just eight years ago, $1.2 million for the very first cell cultured beef patty. So the cost curve is moving in the direct, yeah, not a lot of people eat it at McDonald's. <laughs> but um, two other innovators um, are um, Diane Wu and Purnima Paraswaran. They met in graduate school at Stanford where they formed Trace Genomics in 2015. What they do essentially is offer DNA kits um, for the soils. These are not unlike the genetic kits that you might get. What, it's a 23andMe that gives you your human sense of your traits and your ancestry and you know, your vulnerability to disease. What they do is analyze a few grams of soil from different parts of the, the, the farms and then they digitalize what is a vast amount of data about the bacteria, the viruses, and fungi in, that, um, in those soil samples, and then they compare it through their proprietary algorithms with thousands of other soil samples, and then provide actionable intelligence to the farmers about what seeds to plant where, um, what nutrients to feed the soil's microbes, and how to avoid diseases that lurk in the dirt. What they claim what's happening is that a lot of all these decisions about what to plant, you know, how to feed the microbes, how to you know, deal with pests, has been an art form, and farmers are great at it, but it really is you know, their sense of just what's going to, predictions about what's going to happen. These two entrepreneurs suggest that they're turning something that had been prediction into a science. Three, three others, Jenny Dew and James Rogers and Lou Perez, um, they want to cut food waste in half. They have PhDs in material science and chemistry from UC Santa Barbara, my alum, <laughs> um, which I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> they devise plant-based coatings um, to double the shelf lives of avocados, pears, peaches, all sorts of produce. We waste in this country a staggering 40% of our food. Let that sink in, 40% of our food gets wasted. The food loss portion of that problem, according to these innovators, is rather forward. They say the two leading causes of produce spoilage are either water loss or oxidation. And that's water evaporating out of the fruits or oxygen getting in. So these three have created tasteless, odorless, invisible, and edible coatings, consist of basically fatted acids from the peels of other produce that serve as a physical barrier to keep the water in and the oxygen out. And this is their example of um, what happens after day 54, um, after the coating is there. They've gotten a whole lot of investment. Oprah has invested in the company. They just got another $250 million um, fundraise. So they are now what's referred to as a high tech or an ag tech unicorn, as billion dollar um, startups are called. They are now valued at about $2 billion. Irving Fain. He's the CEO of a company called Bowery, and I think he is one of the ones that is totally redefining what it is to be a farm, or what a farm is. We always think of the farm as this, as we showed the picture before, this vast expanse of land that's horizontal, uh, that seems, seemingly goes on forever. Ever. What he's doing is creating um, vertical warehouses in urban and suburban centers that do not rely on either soil or sunlight. 
These are designed by some of the same designers that did Amazon's massive fulfillment centers. Um, but these warehouses, instead of um, providing, if you will, uh, books and jewelry, they're providing uh, through their you know, sophisticated sensors and robots, um, bok choy and lettuce. Um, and they're just massive. Um, they use no pesticides. They cut water use by 95%. Um, they produce 100 times the output um, of an equivalent sized plot of horizontal land. Significant, their growing season <laughs> goes on forever and never ends. So they can allow quick delivery of fresh organic produce um, to nearby um, restaurants and supermarkets. Um, Fain is particularly uh, interested in the economic development side of such a thing because he thinks he can bring vigor to inner city communities and make high tech farming something that provides good paying jobs in formerly abandoned spaces within neglected neighborhoods. Two more, Thomas Paul Armas and Sebastian Boyer. They grew up as friends in France uh, before one attended MIT and the other Stanford. They offer autonomous machines or robots um, that detect weeds and then mimicking somebody with a, a little hoe, that machine comes in and plucks out the, the little weed and throws it in a, a pile and takes, takes it away. Um, the key point here is they do that without any poisonous herbicides. So this machine within this um, Zam orange Zamboni looking you know, um, monster um, is the technology is absolutely stunning. I mean, they have FarmWise is the name of their company. They have taken thousands and thousands of pictures of different weeds and crops at different times of their development and under divergent you know, growing conditions. So with machine learning, this machine can, um, can create images of what it needs to remove and what it needs to save. And then through their algorithms, as sophisticated, to be honest, as what Facebook and Google have when they um, get, take pictures of our face and figure out who we are, they know what's a weed and they know what's going to be broccoli um, at whatever stage it happens to be. And then they go in and that, as I said, they have um, pluckers that remove the unwanted plants from the field and avoid, from their perspective, hours of backbreaking manual labor. And the, um, these things, of course, also operate 24 hours a day uh, without any human sitting inside of it. Also attacking weeds is Eric Taipale. Um, he is the founder and now the chief technology officer at Santerra, this Minneapolis ag science um, firm. And like most ag innovators I interviewed, he never came from, he didn't grow up as a farmer. He grew up um, and spent 30 years in the aerospace industry, mostly focused on drones. Um, now ag drones, agricultural drones, have been around for you know, a while. Um, but what's happening, he claims, is that there's a, a, this revolution that I mentioned before, this confluence of technologies. The sensors, particularly the multi-spectral sensors that they can now put on the cameras, are so much more advanced than they were even last year and the computing power to be able to decipher what that data means as far as detecting. In his case, he's identifying through his proprietary software, um, coming up with centimeter by centimeter maps of his fields or the fields of people that hire him. Um, and the shades of green will show different weed concentrations. And then once he gets a picture of where in fact there are more weeds, he sends out either this um, or a, um, a self-driving tractor that targets herbicides only to those areas where it really is needed, where there is a, a real outgrowth of weeds, cutting the cost of herbicides or chemical costs by more, more than three quarters. This next one, you'll probably wonder why the heck she's here, but I, um, Virginia Emery, um, she grows bugs, <laughs> um, customized bugs. Um, her favorite is mealworm um, beetles. I'll show you those in a second. Um, what's unique about her is that she's figured out how to grow them at substantial volumes. And why that's important is that um, poultry and fish farms actually like worms. And worms substitute for the soybeans and corn that are traditionally grown and fed to them that require, as I mentioned, the erosion, the irrigation, the plowing, and everything else associated with conventional agriculture. So she claims that her insects um, take up 
mealworm beetles, lots of them. <laughs> they take up little space, they live happily when they're jammed together, they survive without light, they breed throughout the year, they emit few pollutants or greenhouse gases, they require little feed, they are, in her words, the most sustainable response to agriculture's challenges. And their poop, they, they do poop. She sells that as what's called frass, which is a very high quality form of organic um, fertilizer. So finally, um, we'll meet Lynette Kusma and Amelia Sepulveda. They're co-founders of a company called Natural Machines. They're making real the replicator that you might remember from Star Trek. This will all date us. Um, this machine, as you might recall, um, was able to synthesize meals on demand. They, they do 3D printing of meals. Their device is called a Fudini. It's about the size of a microwave. It has stainless steel containers that store natural and fresh ingredients and computer stockpiles recipes. Uh, it can link to your Fitbit, so if you've gone out for a run, it knows that when it prints a little candy bar for you, it'll have extra iron or vitamin D because you know that you need that because uh, you've just been out running. Um, so uh, there are Michelin star chefs that are using this thing uh, because they're able to, with the lasers, create unbelievably um, meticulous you know, coatings for cakes or um, you know, appetizers. Um, the, um, there are some restaurants that are displaying the device in their restaurants so, uh, just because it attracts um, consumers to come in and watch their food being made you know, by lasers in front of them would drive my, nut, my wife nuts, who's a chef, but um, they also, uh, KFCs are now selling chicken nuggets made from fruit, Foudinis in various locations. So according to Kusma, uh, the Foudini is reinventing our culinary ways. My point of showing these is that there's just so much new that's going on in this critical sector that we all sort of take for granted that I think that there's a um, sort of a quiet revolution that disrupting this agricultural sector and creating for us new eating options. The growth of farm, sure. Yeah, I mean they've got stainless steel containers that will, um, you know, take chicken broth or chicken um, that has been, you know, ground up, and then layer it in whatever um, fashion that the laser would like to, you know, to make it. Yeah, and you can bread it, you can do. I mean, what, what it, there are some things that it doesn't do all that well, which you can probably guess, but I mean, things like, you know, pasta is easy for them. I mean, because it's just, you know, natural ingredients of. Um, they've got two different kinds of lasers. One is the blue one, which, um, you know, penetrates within whatever they're cooking, perhaps a chicken McNugget. Um, or, Chicken nugget, not necessarily McNugget, um, and, and then they've got you know a, um, a I think a red one that then can you know glaze over to whatever your specifications are you know how crispy you want um, it to be. So they cook by laser. Yes. Sorry. Let me just I'm at I'm at the end so you'll, we'll get to all of this. I, I was trying to suggest that this growth um, is. Um, is really just quite stunning and I think largely unrecognized. Um, the positive side I think is it gives us farmers as well as consumers more options than we had thought that we had. They're not all going to be good and we're not going to necessarily trust them all as far as being you know great for society. Um, my wife may hate them. You may think you know um, that printing out um, you know a, a chicken nugget sounds crazy it, in some regard it is, but my suggestion here is that all of these things that we've seen today didn't exist 10 years ago. None of these companies existed even eight, nine years ago. Um, the growth has been astonishingly rapid. Uh, nobody was produce, producing cell-based proteins without slaughtering animals. Nobody was challenging the horizontal farm um, and growing plants vertically, and nobody was plucking weeds robotically or uh, coating produce to double the shelf life of them. So in this age of food and farm challenges, I'm trying to argue that innovators offer hope um, for feeding a growing population nutritiously, equitably, and sustainably. So 
I appreciate your interest. I appreciate being invited back. Uh, my commendations once again on a great library. I hope you enjoy the book. Uh, my thanks to Learned Owl, a great local bookstore who's selling them, and I'd be happy to sign, of course. <laughs> and um, I appreciate your invitation and um, your being here. So thanks.